My name is Jill Steinberg, and I have the pleasure today, May 6, 2010, to interview Leo Bierman Jr. of Memphis at the Supreme Court Building in Jackson, Tennessee. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Leo, for the record, can you tell us your name and date and place of birth? I'm Leo Behrman. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, August 20th, 1935. And well, tell us about your parents and growing up in Memphis. <laughs> my parents, uh, my father was born in St. Louis, my mother in Memphis. My father practiced law for about 65 years. My mother was a librarian for a while at what we used to call the Cossett Library and now it's the Memphis Public Library. And uh, I guess I had a normal growing up life in Memphis. And Lived here all my life. And your father was also Leo Beerman, is that right? Correct. And what was your mother's name? Dorothy. And um, where did you attend high school? I went to Central High School in Memphis for high school. Were there any teachers at Central High School that uh, played a particular influence in uh, what you became interested in in your later life? Well, my English teacher, Elizabeth Clinton, um, knew that I wanted to go east to school and knew that the curriculum at Central, at least as far as literature was concerned, was very limited, so she saw to it that I read extra materials, extra books, extra novels, uh, so that I could have a much better background uh, than ordinarily I would have had in addition to a heavy dose of grammar, which she gave me. And uh, Ms. Um, Rebecca Young, I took four years of Latin from her. She was, I think, the first uh, Phi Beta Kappa woman Phi Beta Kappa from Vanderbilt. She was a remarkable lady. She also taught my father, as did uh, my math teacher, Laura Mosey. So those, those teachers particularly were influential and, and uh, helpful. So why did you want to go east to school? What, what gave you that idea? Well, the truth is that um, I wanted to go to the best place, at least in my mind, that I could go. And I had uh, two friends who were already at Yale, and Yale seemed to be a, um, a challenging and, and uh, uh, important sounding to me place at the time. <laughs> and so I applied to Yale, and I applied to Princeton, and I applied to Vanderbilt. And I got into all three and ended up at Yale. And tell me about your years at Yale and what were, what were the most important aspects of attending Yale that influenced your life later? Well, that's difficult. I, I, uh, enjoyed, I enjoyed Yale. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the learning experience. I enjoyed the, uh, the intellectual effort that was required. I particularly, I was an English major, and I particularly enjoyed uh, that. I had one, I had a lot of good teachers, a lot of great teachers, uh, but the greatest teacher I had was a man named Maynard Mack. He taught Shakespeare, and he was dynamic, he was mesmerizing, spellbinding, and uh, instilled in me a love of Shakespeare that's never left me. When you, he taught Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and if your date came in, in those days Yale was all male, no female. <laughs> um, if your date came in early on Friday, she had to go uh, with you to Professor Mack's Shakespeare class because you wouldn't miss that under any circumstances. He was a very great teacher and uh, I still read Shakespeare and I still study it and I still teach it to some extent. So 
that was certainly one highlight. Did you know that you always wanted to go to law school? Yes. Uh, after I got over the uh, idea of being a cowboy and, um, and a fireman probably, although I don't even recall those, I always wanted to go to law school, and my father, of course, was a lawyer, and um, never occurred to me to do anything else. And why did you choose Harvard Law School? Well, probably the same reason that I chose Yale undergraduate, and that is that I thought at the time, and I think it was true, that Harvard was the best law school in the world if I could get in. And so I I applied to Harvard, and I applied to Yale, and I applied to Vanderbilt again, and I got into all three, and fortunately, and was fortunate enough to be able to do that, and so that's where I ended up. Now, was that an unusual thing to go from, you know, Harvard and Yale are, are competitors? Not, not really. Um, some people um, did the opposite. Some people went from Harvard undergraduate to Yale law school. and. Um, Yale was thought to have a different uh, uh, philosophy of teaching uh, law than did Harvard and uh, in those days. I can't speak to the circumstance right now. And um, so I, I felt that if I had a chance to get to Harvard, uh, that's where I wanted to go. So fortunately, that's where I ended up. So tell us about your experience at Harvard Law School. Um, very intense, very pressurized. Um, there were an awful lot of very, very bright people there, and the competition was fierce, very fierce. Um, the pressure was very great. Uh, people were competing for grades because they were then competing for um, job positions. And uh, so the competition and the pressure was high, and um, and it it stayed that way for all through all through three years. Was there ever any stigma uh, being from the South or from Memphis when you were in school in the East? Uh, other than occasionally, um, I never thought I had much of a Southern accent, and still don't. But occasionally, uh, one of my professors would. Uh, needle me a little bit about uh, my accent, but there really wasn't. Um, Harvard was very diverse, except for women. We had very few women in our class. Uh, Harvard had uh, 500 in freshman, entering freshman class, and probably less than 10 women at that time. Now Harvard has more than 50 percent of the class uh, women. But um, it was very diverse and, and uh, as I say, uh, very intellectual and very intense. Everyone taught uh, Socratic method. Um, my contracts professor, Clark Bice, was the model for Professor Kingsfield in the paper chase. And he was the best Socratic method teacher I ever saw. He was. He could play a class like you would play a piano. If he wanted uh, liberal construction, he knew where to go. If you if he wanted uh, strict construction, he knew where to go in the class. And he was a terrific, terrific teacher. That was first year or two. So, is there anything that you recall about the teachers, professors, the other students that uh, you think were the most influ influential in your later law practice? Um, you know, frankly, the, the pressure and the stress was probably very influential because the practice of trial law, at least I've always felt, is very stressful and very pressured. And so um, I think that taught me how to, to some extent, to work under fire, if you will. Um, the uh, intellectual effort required to do well uh, probably helped considerably in forcing me to want to do the best job I could possibly do on any kind of work that I was doing in, in my career. And I think all of those, and of course the teachers were great, and um, we had 
um, storied, I'll say, teachers, Paul Freund in constitutional law, Archibald Cox in labor law, Austin Scott of Scott on Trusts and Trusts, who smoked two pipes at the same time in class. Remarkable. <laughs> um, Clark Bice, as I said, was um, memorable. I sort of I patterned my present teaching at the University of Memphis Law School a little bit after him. I'm not as tough as he was, but um, I think all of that, the, 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 uh, the necessity of being able to answer a question under, under stress while everybody is staring at you is, is, uh, is disconcerting for someone who's not had to do that before. And uh, the fact that I had to do it before for three years uh, was probably very helpful. Did you make a lot of contacts uh, in undergrad at Yale and then later in Harvard Law School Both. that you became friendly with or stayed in touch with or assisted you in your law career later? Um, well, I, I, I'm friendly with a lot of people at both places, probably more at, um, at Yale than, than Har Harvard. But um, one, uh, Richard Shepard Arnold, who was Judge Richard Shepard Arnold of the Eighth Circuit was uh, number one at uh, Exeter, number one at Yale, and number one at Harvard Law School. He, w he was the greatest legal mind I ever encountered. And we stayed friends uh, after law school. He, as you probably know, was over in Arkansas, and, and he and his brother were both on the Eighth Circuit at the same time, which was highly unusual. Um, Dick tragically died um, far too young, um, but he, he had an extraordinary mind. And uh, if you ever were sick and missed a class, you'd want to get his notes because um, it was like reading a book. It was uh, he printed. In fact, I got my habit of printing um, notes and. Um, and uh, trial notes and everything else from him because he printed. Uh, I never saw him write his name. Uh, he was e exceptional, did, exceptional. Did your Harvard Law School contacts ever send you business later in your career? Some have, yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've gotten some business um, from some. Mr. Justice Scalia was in my class, although um, I'm still not on the United States Supreme Court, as you well know, so <laughs> that hasn't uh, done me much good. Um, Michael Dukakis was in my class. He later became governor of Massachusetts and was a presidential candidate, not a very successful one. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I get a lot of business from, from those relationships, absolutely. Well, before we talk some more about the uh, evolution of your legal career, let me ask you some questions about your family. Okay. Um, your wife's name is? Joy. And what was her maiden name? Joy Magdabitz. Right. And she, did she also grow up in Memphis? She actually was born in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and lived there for about a year, and then went to Hughes, Arkansas, and lived there for a few years, and then the family finally came over to Memphis. And when did you meet, or how did you meet? We knew each other from high school, and um, we were sort of buddies uh, in high school. But um, <laughs> after um, high school, and we started dating when I was in college and got married uh, halfway through law school. So how many years have you been married to Joy? Fifty. Wow. And you have... Three children, Three is that children. correct? And what are their names? David uh, Behrman is uh, born in 1960. Edward Behrman is born in, was born in 1964. And Amy Behrman Dorsey was born in 1968. And in fact, for the record, <laughs> um, my birthday is August 20th. Joy's is August 25th. David's is August 12th. Eddie's is August 17th, and Amy's is August 13th. Wow. <laughs> so it makes it... 
And for an you, awful lot of cake in one, <laughs> one month. And you have grandchildren, I know. I How many grandchildren do you have? I have seven. David has three children, Amy has two, and Eddie has two. And were any of them born in August? No, <laughs> they weren't. I guess they got tired of that idea. None of them were. Now, I know both Eddie and David chose to go to law school. Correct. Did you encourage them to do so? You know, I really didn't encourage it at all. I, I, I encouraged them to do what they wanted to do. Um, David started, uh, frankly, in the furniture business after, uh, I think David really wanted to be a professional musician, but um, that didn't seem to last very long. Um, He's a great musician, but to do it for a living, I think he decided it was not a good idea. And he was in the furniture business for a while with my father-in-law, uh, and then decided he wanted to go to law school and said, can I? And I said, sure. Uh, Eddie, I think at one time, wanted to be a teacher, um, but um, also decided that he wanted to go to law school and, and did. And Amy is, uh, she has the toughest job of all of us. She's teaching in the public school system. Did you have opportunities to practice with both Eddie and David? Yes, no, it was great. Well, tell I us had about the opportunity that. to practice with my father. I loved that. I practiced with Daddy for, oh, I guess it would be from 1960 when I finished law school till he died in 1988. And that was great, and I loved that. Uh, and David uh, and Edward were. Uh, I practiced with them in the law firm for a while. Eddie, did, Eddie decided to go out on his own, and so he's out on his own in Memphis. Uh, David is a partner in my firm, as you know, and so I, I enjoy that idea. I love practicing with my father, and I like practicing with my sons. Even when one son calls me up on the phone and says, uh, Daddy, let me run something by you. <laughs> that's that's fun. Well, we'll, well, I want to talk about the law practice in the law firm in a few minutes, but um, when you got out of Harvard Law School, did you think about doing anything other than coming back to Memphis? Uh, I didn't. My father did. D uh, Daddy uh, encouraged me to stay up east with what he called, you know, the big-time firms. Um, and I really didn't want to do that. I mean, I obviously had the opportunity to do it, uh, but I didn't even apply. All I wanted to do was come back and practice with my father, and that was the only goal as far as uh, how I practiced was concerned. So I never really um, considered practicing up east, even though he r really did encourage me to, to do that at least for a while. I didn't want to. I wanted to come back and practice, and so when I, when I graduated, I came back. And when you, when you him. came back to Memphis, you went straight to work with your dad? Right. And what type of a law firm, uh, what kind of a practice did you have at that time? We had a very, very intense insurance defense firm, together with a general practice. I mean, we did, I, I did adoptions, I did, um, I incorporated businesses, I didn't do any tax, I was smart enough not to get involved with that. Uh, but I had a, I wrote contracts, I, I, I probated wills, um, I drafted wills, I did all that until um, those things became more complex than I, than I was able to handle. Uh, but for a long time when we practiced together, it was mostly insurance defense work. We represented a lot of insurance companies uh, and so I was in court every day almost. And was it just you and your dad or did you have anybody else in the law firm with you? Bob Burton, Robert Burton had been with my father for a long time and uh, stayed with him. By that time my father had left Mr. Winchester and had been in his in the law firm of Leo Behrman and Bob Burton was with um, my father and when I came in we also after that brought in some younger lawyers, although they were, I was a young lawyer at the time as well, and uh, from time to time uh, brought in 
other young artists, but we never had more than four people in the firm. But, and so we had a very intense practice. We were in court all the time. Um, and you mentioned, it was a lot of work. You mentioned that your father had been in practice with Mr. Winchester. Was that Mr. Lee Winchester Sr.? Sr., right. Lee and, Winchester Sr. And they were in the Commerce Title Building. And um, before that, my father practiced for a very short time with his two brothers, Joe and A.D. Behrman. Uh, but he left them to go with Mr. Winchester and then left Mr. Winchester to go out on his own in preparation for my coming with him. When you first began to practice law, do you recall anything about what kind of a salary you were making or how, how that worked? You know, you asked me that on the way over here, and um, <laughs> I don't recall the number $25,000 a year um, suggests that was probably more than it really was. Maybe that was just wishful thinking. Um, my father and I were always 50-50 partners, but his 50 always counted more than my 50, and that was, of course, appropriate. But um, what I earned was what he decided to pay me. And so I'm not really sure, I don't recall exactly what it was, um, but it seemed to me uh, pretty sumptuous at the time. <laughs> and, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you had a big insurance defense practice. Do you recall how it was that you charged the clients that you worked with? When, when I first started, um, we didn't have any hourly billing. My father, uh, and we didn't bill uh, the client until we finished the case. So uh, there was no interim billing at all. You, so there was certainly a uh, strong motive to get the case tried and, or settled and, and get the bill in. Um, my father would look at the file, think about uh, what was done, think about what the result was, and send in a bill. I never figured out how he did that, um, but I never was aware of any client that ever objected to a bill he sent in. And when the insurance companies finally said, we've got to have hourly rate billing, my father really protested. He did not like that idea. And I said, Daddy, we're gonna, we forget half the stuff we've done on these files we're going to do a lot better with hourly billing rates. And, and of course, we did um, because we kept track of what we were doing all the time instead of trying to remember it at the end of a case. But when we started, it was just his feel of what the file looked like, felt like, and what the results were. Did you ever get any opportunities to try any cases with your dad? Yes. Yes, um, I did indeed. I, well, I, I sat in on a lot of his cases, but uh, the first time he gave me a jury case to try, I'd been practicing about, I don't know, four months, <laughs> and uh, he said, all right, take this case and don't, you know, you, you can't win it, it's a rear end collision, uh, but uh, the lawyer on the other side's a nice guy and uh, you're going to be in front of Judge Andrew Holmes, and uh, he's kind of strict, but um, you know you won't have any trouble. And I said, fine, that's great. That's what I want, but Daddy, I don't want you to come down. I don't want you to sit with me. And he said, I, you know, I don't have any interest in sitting. I've got a lot of work to do here. And I said, fine, just don't come down, because if you're sitting at the council table with me, I'll be worried about whether I should have done this or should have done that. And um, he said, you know, I'm just not interested in coming down. I've got too much to do. So I, anyway, I went down in Division Three with Judge Andrew Holmes, who was a great trial judge, a great trial judge. Later went on the Supreme Court of Tennessee. Um, and I was obviously nervous. And um, we got the jury picked, and um, the case started. And it was about, we, we'd taken our morning break, and um, We'd started back up again, and in about 15 minutes, Judge uh, Holmes said, uh, we'll take another break. And uh, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. So 
the jury filed out, and Holmes said, uh, Ju Judge Holmes said, uh, Mr. Behrman, of course, I stood up, and I realized he wasn't looking at me. He was looking behind me, and I turned around, and my father was there. <laughs> and he said, Mr. Behrman, uh, what are you doing here? And my father said, Judge, I'm, uh, I told my son I wouldn't come down here, but I got so nervous. This is his first case, and I'm so nervous about it that, I, I, look, I'm going to sit in the back of the courtroom, not going to sit up at the counsel table, um, and I'll be real quiet, and I'm just going to, I just want to sit here. And Holmes looked at me, and he looked back at my father and said, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Behrman, your son's doing all right. I'm ordering you out of the court. <laughs> and my father laughed just like you just laughed. And Holmes looked sternly at him and said, Mr. Behrman, apparently you didn't hear me very clearly. I said, I'm ordering you out of the courtroom. Um, and Daddy got up and left. That's the best thing that ever happened to me uh, as far as a trial lawyer was concerned. Um, to be able to go out there and do it on your own? Sure, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that, uh, and Holmes knew that. Um, and my father never, never tried a case, never sat in on a case with me again. And, and th that, isn't, that isn't sad. That's good. He, he wanted me to, he knew that he had a style and, and I had to develop my own style. And so I did develop my own style, and, and judges told me, you know, when I went into their court, you can't do what your father does. He can get away with things that you can't. Well, now, you know, maybe I can get away with things that you can't. But <laughs> um, that was my first jury case, and um, Judge Holmes did me a great, great favor. Well, now, I had always heard that about you and your father, about the different styles. And uh, tell us about what you know about the different styles that you and your father had as trial lawyers. I, 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 you'll have to ask somebody else about my style. I, I don't know <laughs> what my style is. But my father could laugh people out of court. Uh, my father could take the most dangerous case uh, and um, start the jury laughing. And uh, before anybody knew it, they came in for the defendant. Uh, he, was, he was an exceptional trial lawyer. Um, he had complete command of the courtroom. I watched a lot of his cases, of course. Um, and um, he was very effective before juries, very effective indeed. Now, you know, I tried over the years, not I, I never modeled my style after him. Um, I have a different approach to trying a case, perhaps, than than uh, he does. But as I say, what my style is, you'll have to you'll have to testify to. <laughs> well, I, I I do remember being very impressed, and lots of people were very impressed with your ability during jury trials to memorize all the jurors' names during jury selection. Well, you know, I did do that, and I still do that. Um, and I did that because in, in voir dire, I was a young lawyer in those days, a long time ago, and, and I felt that most of the lawyers who I would be up against were older and that the jury might say, well, you know, if this is a close question, we'll go with the more experienced uh, lawyer. I didn't want that to happen, obviously, because I was not the more experienced as a rule. I was the young guy. And so I got the idea that when they put the jurors in the box, I would remember their names. People like to have their names remembered. And so I would be able to go down uh, the row and say, Miss Bernstein, Miss Steinberg. Um, and I did that just to, in effect, say to the jury, uh, this fellow may be worthwhile listening to. That was my goal, just to be sure that they would be listening to me. And after I did that several times, um, the deputy sheriffs wouldn't let me stop doing that because when they brought it, when they brought a group of jurors up from the jury pool, they would say, "Now watch, watch this. This young fellow will—he'll know all your names." 
right off the bat. So I, I couldn't stop doing it, and so I've never stopped doing it. And uh, Was there a particular trick? Um, that no made trick. you able I, to do it? I wish I had a trick. Sometimes it's hard to do, especially especially when um, they put you know, 14 or 16 or 18 jurors up there um, at one time. I, I, I don't have a trick. I just am fortunate enough to be able to do it. Where was your first office when you began practicing with your dad? In uh, the Steric building. And did you stay in the Steric building until your later merger? Yes, uh, until we merged with what was then called the High School Donaldson Adams Williamson Kirsch firm. Um, we were in the Steric building on the 11th floor. The uh, we had a, a small suite of offices on the 11th floor. The rest of the 11th floor was taken up with the FBI. The FBI headquarters were on the 11th floor of the Steric building. Now, of course, they're in the federal building. So it's a fortunate thing that we had no criminal practice because nobody would ever have <laughs> shown up. Um, so what was your daily routine like during those first, I guess, 20 years of practice that you were in the small law firm with your dad? The daily routine usually was go getting ready and going into court. Uh, because I, we were representing lots of insurance companies and I was in court all the time, either in general sessions or, as years went on, circuit and chancery. Uh, but I started jury trials, as I, as I told you, within about four months of beginning practice. So most of it was getting ready for cases or going down and trying cases. And uh, on Fridays, going down for motions, and on Saturday and Sunday, get, getting ready to go back into court on Monday. When you first began to practice, you mentioned that you did a lot of different things, wills and that kind of thing, but tried a lot of insurance defense cases. Did you eventually begin to specialize in any particular areas of practice? When we merged with the high school firm, Daddy and I merged in 1980, my practice was still intensively insurance defense. Um, we merged because the high school firm indicated they wanted me as a trial lawyer. And um, they were gracious enough. At that time, I wanted to keep Daddy out of court. He didn't need to go into court anymore at, at, at his age. Uh, but they were, uh, the, the high school firm was gracious enough to say we wanted my father too. Obviously, I wouldn't have gone without him. Um, and so when I came over to the law firm, I was still intensely uh, insurance defense oriented. And happily, I could turn over my general practice of wills and uh, incorporations and um, probate work to people that knew what they were doing. <laughs> um, but as time went on, um, I did less and less insurance defense and more and more of what we now call commercial or business litigation. All right, well, let's talk about your change from the small law firm to the big law firm. Um, you, your firm joined High School Donaldson, Adams, Williams, and Kirsch and became known as High School Donaldson, Beerman, Adams, Williams, and Kirsch. Right. Uh, which is now Baker Donaldson Beerman, Caldwell and Berkowitz. Right. What were the differences at the beginning, in the early 80s, with your small practice going into a larger law firm? The big difference, well, when we were talking merger with Bill Kirsch, who was a senior partner with the high school firm, when Daddy and I were talking, uh, Bill said, now when we assign a case, Leo, Junior, what we do, we fill out this form, we fill out that form, and we have a responsible attorney, we have a billing attorney, we ha and that sort of stuff. How do, how do y'all work it? And <laughs> I told him the way we work it is my father would yell, Leo Jr., come in here and take this case. And that's, that's the way we assigned it. So I had to get used to, to some extent, 
you know, handling uh, and, and complying with the administrative aspects. Um, I also had to get used to um, the slick new technical stuff that uh, the high school firm had, you know, like lots of, we, we did have a, we didn't have a Xerox machine, Daddy and I, we had a uh, Thermofax. Um, I won't even try to tell you how that worked, but um, the high school firm had much more modern equipment than we did and uh, had word processors and all of that stuff. But uh, other than that, and the fact that, you know, I had to find my way around the office because there were a couple of floors there and I wasn't used to that. Other than that, uh, frankly, um, I was able to, and I hope still do, practice law the same way I did uh, when I was, uh, when Daddy and I were together, and that is my door stays open, anybody wants to come in and say, what do you think about this, or how would you handle that, or I don't understand how to do this, um, that's what I'm there for, and I want to be available. So, except for the fact that it was larger, um, and there were more, you know, partners that I had to um, defer to, or at least defer to their judgments as well as insist on my own. Um, it wasn't that big a transition, although I thought it was going to be. I, I thought, sure, my clients would never find me on the other side of Third Street, <laughs> uh, but happily they did. And where was High School Donaldson, Beerman, Adams, Williams, and Kirsch located? In the First Tennessee Building, where it is today where our firm is today, or at least the Memphis part of our firm is today. And it's catty corner across from the Steric building. So obviously your clients had no trouble finding you, and did they all come with you when you joined the firm? As far as I remember, they did. About how many lawyers did the firm have when you joined? I think in those days, when I first started, Jill, we had maybe 16 or 18, maybe 20. I, I really don't remember exactly. We had a couple of floors. Um, probably around 20. We brought over four people. Daddy uh, came over, I came over, Bob Burton came over, and Jerry Potter came over. Well, I know in 1985 when I joined the law firm we had about 45 lawyers. Um, and since that time, there's been a lot of growth at now over 500 lawyers right. and offices all over Tennessee and the South. Uh, how has that changed your law practice and your perspective on practice of law? Well, the f first difficult thing is that naturally I know the name of every single one of my partner's <laughs> associates and, uh, and uh, people on the staff. Uh, how has it changed? It's given me greater opportunities for major type of litigation. It's given me um, greater opportunities for very excellent assistance and, and support, not just from um, lawyers in the firm, but from staff in the firm. Really, uh, it's a remarkable law firm, and it's a remarkable group of people, and uh, it's given me great opportunities uh, to represent um, major issues, more uh, significant constitutional questions than I had before, uh, more complex questions and more complex litigation than I had ever done or been able to do before. So it's been certainly a great opportunity for me. Now, Leo, a big part of your career has been focused on trying lawsuits. Right. Um, how has the trial practice changed since you first began practicing law? Um, well, first place, uh, trials are shrinking, as you know. You're a trial lawyer as well as I. Um, and by shrinking, I mean there are fewer trials. There are fewer jury trials than ever before. Um, but the cases seem to be enormously more complex, maybe because we know more than we did before, maybe because the cases uh, are much more complex in and of themselves. For example, there, there, weren't, there, weren't, there weren't many class action cases when I first started practicing law, certainly not in the areas that I was working in. Um, now, uh, that's a usual thing. And so I used to say that I could carry 
uh, three files in my briefcase at one time. Now it takes about 400 boxes of, uh, to carry one file over to the court. It, it is the complexity of the trial and, and frankly the fact that there are fewer of them and, and the fact that they are enormously more expensive enormously more expensive, which is probably why there are fewer trials. What are some of the important and interesting or challenging cases that you've worked on in the last several years? Hmm. Well, one obviously is the uh, defense of the city of Memphis and the Memphis Light, Gas and Water Division uh, in the suit by Mississippi, state of Mississippi over the pumping in the aquifer. Well, tell us a little bit about that case. Um, the state of Mississippi sued um, Memphis and the Memphis Light, Gas, and Water Division, asserting that the pumping uh, by the Memphis Light, Gas, and Water Division for uh, in Shelby County had uh, taken water from under uh, the state of Mississippi in the aquifer that we that underlies western Tennessee and also a good part of Mississippi and Arkansas and maybe a little bit of Louisiana and Texas as well. And they uh, sued for more than a billion dollars asserting that it was Mississippi's water and that we owed damages. Um, that case went to the Supreme Court. Um, is that we the United States Supreme Court? Yes, we, we asserted that uh, at the trial level that the case could not go forward because Tennessee was an indispensable party and um, if Tennessee were joined as a party, that would be state versus state, which would uh, set the jurisdiction, original jurisdiction, in the Supreme Court of the United States. And the court agreed with that position, the trial court, and dismissed the case when we were on the day, of, the first day of trial. Uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed. Uh, the United States Supreme Court denied cert. Um, However, um, at the same time, the state of Mississippi uh, f filed a motion to be allowed to, to uh, file an original suit in the United States Supreme Court naming the state of Tennessee and the city of Memphis. We opposed that along with the state of Tennessee, and uh, the Supreme Court denied that motion, but without prejudice. So uh, theoretically, uh, some other kind of lawsuit might be brought in the future. We, we don't know yet. We'll now, see. Now, both MLG and W and the city of Memphis, of course, have their own legal staffs. Um, why do you think they reached out to you and our law firm to handle a case like this? Well, you know, modesty <laughs> forbids me from. <laughs> Hopefully, they thought that we were, that we and our law firm were capable of handling what is obviously a major piece of litigation. There were 100,000 um, exhibits, pages of exhibits. There were, I don't know how many, 20, 30 depositions taken. Um, it was an enormous undertaking. And, and so I'm, I'm pleased and appreciative that the, uh, the city uh, retained us. I, I had represented the city before in um, what we used to call the Toy Towns case, where um, the legislature passed a, um, an act which would allow a group of people as small as 250 to incorporate. Um, and was that the state legislature that had yes, passed that? Yes, and um, we represented um, the city of Memphis and other major um, cities in Tennessee and uh, argued that in the, United, in the Tennessee Supreme Court. and. Supreme Court agreed with our position that that was an unconstitutional piece of legislation. And there, there have been others. Um, I handled the, um, the term limits case in Shelby County affirming the, uh, the uh, constitutionality of the term limits in the Shelby County Charter. And, um, now, Others. the the city of Memphis and Memphis Light, Gas and Water water case, approximately when was that um, finally dismissed by the United States Supreme Court? Well, a petition for certiorari was denied, um, um, I think, uh, I 
think in, in uh, December of uh, this past year. Uh, 2009. I, I think Sometime so. in the last year or so. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I know in that, from having been up in the office, that you had an opportunity to work very closely with your son David right. on that case. And tell us about that. Well, that was obviously um, joyous for me because I enjoy working with him, and he's a very good lawyer, a very good lawyer. And David uh, really was... Uh, really was the uh, person in charge of the briefs and of getting them put together and, of, and he did an enormous amount of work in preparation for trial which never went off because the court granted our motion to dismiss but he took a very very heavy load in that case and will again if anything has ever been brought. Um, we talked earlier we talked earlier about the opportunity to work with both Eddie and, and David. Um, Eddie was with uh, Baker Donaldson, Beerman, Caldwell, and Berkowitz, or maybe High School Donaldson, Beerman, Caldwell, Berkowitz, whoever at the time. Um, what kind of things did you get to work with Eddie on, or has it been mostly just giving him advice as he's... Well, it was both. It, um, it was both um, uh, when, when he had questions or comments or concerns about how a particular matter ought to go. Um, we'd talk. Uh, if I never tried a case with him either. Um, I told him if he wanted me in the courtroom, fine, but if he didn't, uh, I would understand that. Of all people, I would understand <laughs> that. So um, he did a lot of, uh, of uh, defense work for us before he went out on his own. Now, Leo, you've been recognized by, um, I don't know, maybe several magazines and other uh, awards-type uh, um, groups as being the kind of lawyer that people go for bet the company litigation. Uh, what kind of cases have you worked on that would be bet the company kind of litigation? Well, I've, I've named a couple for you. Um, the water case, the um, term limits case, the... Um, the Toy Towns case. I've had some major um, um, work in um, in patent disputes. Um, I've had some very major work in personal injury, very serious product liability personal injury cases. Um, that kind of that kind of case I assume they're talking about. And, and in addition to the trial work that you do, uh, you do a lot of appellate work, is that right? I do. And um, I know you've told me before that appellate work is one of the your favorite things to yeah, do. I enjoy that. I really do enjoy appellate work. And uh, tell us um, what it is you like about the appellate work. Um, you know, that's a, uh, that's a hard question. I, I, I like it because I like to uh, I've got a set of facts that um, raise certain legal issues and it gives me a chance to stand up before three judges or five judges or whatever and um, set out uh, my position as clearly as I can, answer the questions as clearly as I can and, and, uh, and um, persuade them as to the appropriateness of my position. I, I enjoy doing it. It's a, it's a short, thirty-minute sort of burst of uh, energy and and uh, intellectual effort, but it's uh, it's fun. I, I like uh, I like trading uh, a conversation with the court that way, and uh, I'd much prefer to argue before a court that's uh, what we call active or hot than one that just sits there and says nothing and um, I find that challenging. I enjoy it. Are there particular types of cases that you now like better than others, you know, patent versus product liability or commercial or personal injury? Is there any? Well, I like, you know, I like all of them. Uh, I, I, like, I like constitutional questions, obviously. I think those are historic in a way and uh, they're going to have a much more, a much farther reaching um, effect than, you know, than a personal injury case. But um, I like them all, and it, they don't have, it, it isn't necessary that they be so complex. 
um, as it is that they be Im, you know, important to the client. I, I do a lot of, of defense of lawyers who are, who are accused of disciplinary um, infractions. Um, I can't say I enjoy that, but I think I've got an obligation if lawyers call on me to do that, to, to do it. And so I've done a lot of that. I've done a lot of legal malpractice cases as well as um, medical malpractice and, and um, other kinds of professional malpractice. But I don't have any necessary favorite unless you could say constitutional issues are always fascinating. Always. Now, on the legal malpractice and the medical malpractice type cases, you've always been on the defense side, is that right? Pretty much. And Pretty much. Um, in terms of those professional malpractice cases, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of those? Learning, um, learning you know, the technical issues. If it's a medical malpractice, um, learning what the medicine is all about that we're involved with. If it's a product liability case, uh, learning the uh, the physical aspects of the product that I'm talking about. Uh, I always thought that being an English major mm -hmm. was a great advantage in a product liability case. Um, a lot of people think that uh, you know you need to be an engineer or a physicist. Um, it always seemed to me that uh, being an English major was a great advantage because uh, at least from the start, I don't know any more than the jury knows, and I know what the jury doesn't know, therefore. And so when I learn it, whatever the product is, whatever the, whatever the technicalities of the product are, uh, that allows me to uh, see what the jury needs to understand in order to um, grasp my position. And allows you to be a teacher. That's right. Uh, we tried a case um, some years ago. You're right. It does allow me to be a teacher, which I like to do, um, involving a, a bus accident um, and the law and a tie rod which broke, and we built the front end of the truck in the courtroom so that the jury could turn the wheel and watch how the tie rods worked and how they tied in the two wheels uh, so that we could better explain to the jury uh, and show the jury that we didn't have anything to hide. That was fun. That was, that was instructive. And uh, I like to do that. And you're right. I like to teach, so it gives me an opportunity to do that. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about your teaching, but let's take a break right now. I think it's a good time to do that. Okay. All right, Leo, we've been uh, talking about your love of teaching, and that's teaching, I think, within the law firm and teaching your sons to practice law. You've also taught at the University of Memphis Law School. That's true. Uh, tell us why you decided to teach at the law school. Well, um, the law school called me one day years ago, maybe 15 years ago, and asked if I'd be interested in uh, teaching, and I said I would, and they asked me if I would create a course on product liability law. They didn't have one. They had a torts course, but nothing specifically on product liability. And so I did, and I've been teaching that course. Uh, it's a two-hour course in the spring semester for about 15 years now. I really enjoy it. I really I like to watch young people's minds work. I like to test them. and. Um, it's fun for me. It keeps me up to date on product liability law, too. Uh, do you teach that in the evening or is it during the daytime? Um, they're kind enough to let me teach at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, which is not a good time for the students, but uh, the students are gracious enough to show up, and so I get a good crowd, and um, they seem to enjoy it. What do you do if you're in trial and you need to be teaching at the law I school? Have, uh, judges have been very gracious about letting me out um, in time to get to the class at 5. Now, I've missed maybe 
four or five classes in 15 years. And um, most of them have been because I've been out of town trying a case. Um, maybe one time I was ill, but um, the courts have been very gracious about that. Right, well, let's talk about being out of town. Do you like to practice out of town? Uh, not anymore. I used to. Uh, <laughs> and what was I, it that you liked about it? Well, I enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed going to different places, and, and um, I did a lot of that w representing General Motors in product cases and going out to the test track and, and learning about the product and learning about the issues involved. And I really did enjoy that. Um, frankly, uh, airplane travel has become such a hassle that I don't enjoy that anymore at all. I really don't. D did you try any cases out of town? I've tried cases in Arkansas, um, and I've tried very few, but uh, and I've tried cases all over Tennessee, and I think one case in Mississippi. And of course, we were scheduled to try the uh, what, what I call the water case in Mississippi as well. But most of my trial work has been in Tennessee. When you tried cases outside of Memphis, did you ever feel like you were at a disadvantage or you were home cooked because they didn't know you? You know, I never did. Um, I, I may have been, um, but uh, I never really felt that way. I always enjoyed being in the courtroom and, and I didn't uh, run into any problems that, uh, that uh, were insuperable and um, judges of my experience have been very gracious. Um, I enjoyed trying uh, or arguing this uh, water case for the Fifth Circuit. I'd never been to the Fifth Circuit before. Been Sixth Circuit a lot of times, but um, I've never really sensed any home cooking. I really haven't. Would you rather try a case before a judge or a jury? Jury. And why is that? Because I think I can persuade them. <laughs> Uh, and that doesn't mean I don't think I can persuade a court, but um, I have confidence in my ability to persuade a jury. And um, I like the interaction, and, and so I've always enjoyed jury trials. They're harder. They're, they're more stressful. Um, but I, if you give me a choice, I, I'd prefer the jury. On a typical day, since you've been in the big law firm, um, what kind of work habits do you have? Like, what time do you get to work? Uh, do you take lunch? What time do you go home in the evening? Tell us about that. Depends, obviously, on on the day and whether I'm getting ready for trial or not, and and uh, what what's going on. But I usually I get in about 8:30, and I usually leave about 5:30. Um, but um, it varies. Um, right now, I'm, I'm visiting my wife earlier because she's in rehab, and so I'm leaving earlier than usual. And taking care of her knee is that right? Yeah. Um, when you do, you do you go out to lunch, or what do you do about? I eating? rarely eat lunch. Rarely eat lunch. I got out of the habit of eating lunch um, when I was trying cases. This is not smart. I'm not recommending this, but uh, maybe I am recommending. <laughs> but I always thought that um, if I if I had a choice of the blood being in my stomach helping me digest my food or in my brain helping me uh, try the lawsuit, I'd rather, and my clients would rather it be in my brain. So I, I, I quit eating lunch um, when I'm trying cases, and when I'm not trying cases, frankly, I eat very light. I just got out of the habit. Uh, do you eat a good breakfast? Um, no. <laughs> do you eat any breakfast? <laughs> uh, some, but not much, but I eat a big dinner. <laughs> now, um, do you exercise, Leo? Yes. I used to run two miles a day, as we discussed, um, for about 20 years or so, and I came to the conclusion that maybe I wasn't doing my joints any good, and so I now walk two miles a day. But, uh, and I play a lot of golf, uh, not a lot of golf, not nearly as much as I'd like to, but I play golf. What other interests do you have besides golf? Um, obviously my family first, golf, reading is what I and like to do a lot of. What, what kind of things do you read now? 
a lot of uh, fiction, a lot of, uh, a lot of Shakespeare still, a lot of Sherlock Holmes still. Uh, that's one of my favorites. Um, but I try to keep up with the best stuff that's coming out. I, uh, I take the New York Times book review section so that I can see who's writing things that I want to read and so I'm, I've got a lot of books. My house is filled with books and I enjoy that. What was it about Sherlock Holmes that you've always liked? Um, well, in the first place, it's, it's excellent literature. It is excellent short story writing. Uh, second place, um, Sherlock Holmes is probably the most memorable character. I don't admit, of course, that Sherlock Holmes is fictional. Uh, Sherlock, we all know that Sherlock Holmes is alive and keeping bees in Sussex in England somewhere. But um, Sherlock Holmes is probably the most recognizable name in literature, more than Hamlet, more than Romeo and Juliet. Um, it is a remarkable creation of uh, a human being that um, has caught the imagination of people so much so that when Conan Doyle uh, got tired of him and killed him off in the final problem uh, when he and Professor Moriarty, the Napoleon of crime, uh, went over the Reichenbach Falls together, um, People in London walked around with with black armbands. It was uh, people threw rocks through uh, Conan Doyle's window, and he finally brought him back. Um, Conan Doyle thought that his um, novels were the more serious work, but it, it's remarkable literature, and um, when do it's you, fun to read. I enjoy it. It's very relaxing. When do you find time? I don't to like read? other detective stories. <laughs> I do like Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. When do you find time to read? At night. At night when I'm... Now, are you one of those lawyers that uh, lives on just a few hours of sleep, or are you somebody that feels like you need a real long good night sleep? Uh, the answer is I need a long uh, good night sleep, but I don't sleep well anymore as well as I'd like to. Mm -hmm. I wake up too early either thinking about my cases or just because I'm... I can't sleep as much as I'd like to. When you were uh, in your younger years, were you able to sleep a long time, or were Not you also? Not when I was trying lawsuits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not when I was trying lawsuits. Um, do you ever watch television? Yeah. And what do you watch? I, I watch the Golf Channel a lot. Um, I watch the news, which is sometimes depressing, a lot of times depressing. But I, I like to watch the Golf Channel and some of the shows. I, 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 quit, I quit watching uh, lawyer shows. I used to watch them all the time, uh, particularly because I thought that uh, jurors uh, would watch them and that it was important that I know what the jury is looking at. Um, so I... So why did you I quit watching I spent a lot them? of time doing that. Um, I don't enjoy that much anymore, but jurors do watch television, and they and they do believe what they see uh, on the lawyer shows and the detective shows. And so I think you, if you're going to do, if you're going to try cases with jurors, you got to know what they're looking at. Do you read uh, any newspapers? Uh, the Commercial Appeal and a little bit of the New York Times. Do you ever take work home at night? Yes. I used to take. I used to do a lot more than I do now, but um, I used to do it all the time, and that was tough on my family. But um, there was just so much time I could spend on things. And when I was in the middle of trial, I wanted to be sure I was totally ready for the next day. And so, absolutely, I took stuff home, and still do when I have to. And what about working on the weekends? Uh, I don't like that, but I do when I have to. <laughs> you try to save the weekends for golf? Try to. <laughs> try to. If it ever quit raining, I, I might get more in. <laughs> All right. Uh, Leo, we were talking earlier about your teaching at the University of Memphis, and when we were talking about uh, being uh, practicing in a large law firm, you talked about having an open-door policy. Uh, tell me what uh, that open-door policy means to you and what experiences you've had with that. Well, I, you know, 
as you well know, um, my door stays open to my office and I expect young lawyers to come in and say, what do you think about this, or older lawyers, um, and ask my judgment and I'm flattered when they do and, I'm, and I try to give them my best judgment, but I think that's part of what I'm there for. And so, um, I, you know, I can't think of specific examples, and some examples I wouldn't give you anyway. But um, people come in with all kinds of problems, and I think it's part of my job to re help resolve them. Now, so Lee, I do, or I try to. Leo, throughout your career, um, have you been involved in activities with the bar associations? I have. I, I was president of the Memphis Bar Association. Um, I was in the days when we called the the uh, Young Lawyers Division of the State of Tennessee State Bar the Junior Bar, uh, Tennessee State Junior Bar. I was president of that. Um, I've um, I've served on on the uh, commission to write the rules of evidence for the state of Tennessee, and I've served on the uh, Commission to revise the uh, the uh, rules of civil procedure for the state of Tennessee, and both of those were enjoyable and and hopefully helpful to the bar. Now, why why did you think that bar work was important? Why what? Why was bar work important to you? We the the bar speaks very often for my profession. And uh, I think it's important that uh, lawyers be involved in it. I, I really feel strongly about that, I, uh, and I try to encourage that because um, um, we may not always agree with what the American Bar Association or the Tennessee Bar Association or the Memphis Bar Association says. But nonetheless, uh, that's our organization. And if we don't like it, we ought to be active in it to try to make it come out differently. If, so I think it's I think it's very important to work for the bar, and and because we're working for all the lawyers when we do that. Now you mentioned a minute ago about being involved with the uh, Tennessee Rules of Evidence and the Tennessee Rules of Civil Procedure. I know there's at least one rule that people fondly refer to as the yeah, Beerman Rule. That's true, uh, Judge, <laughs> Judge Farmer um, put that in a, in a footnote in an opinion. The uh, it has to do with taking the deposition of expert witnesses. Uh, it always occurred to me that when I wanted to take the other side's expert deposition, I didn't want to cross-examine him or attack him. What I wanted to do is say, give me all your opinions. Tell me why you think this. And I'd get all the information I could so that I could turn that over to my expert to educate me as to whether that was those opinions were accurate or not. Now, if um, if the if that kind of an approach, without any cross examination or attack of any kind, could be used in the courtroom, um, then I was at a tremendous disadvantage in taking a deposition that way. So our 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 group, our commission, um, put in, and, and it works equally well for both sides, plaintiff and defendant, the rule that um, the deposition of the opposing expert could not be used um, at trial unless uh, the expert had died. And so that protected, I'd had courts uh, allow me uh, I I to do that before. I'd had court, uh, federal courts rule that uh, I could be protected uh, with a protective order to that extent in taking the other side's expert deposition. But Tennessee has now put it, uh, we wrote it into the uh, Tennessee practice, and I think it's a good practice, and I think both sides think it's a good practice. Now, as part of your trial work, do you prefer cross-examination or direct examination? Well, I, it's not a matter of preferring. Um, if I've got an effective cross-examination, I prefer cross-examination. <laughs> if I don't, then I'm certainly going to prefer the other one. It, you know, it depends, and every trial is different. And uh, I think I think I think direct examination is underrated in importance, and I think lawyers don't give enough 
care to that. And I think cross-examination is sometimes overrated. I, I think we see, you know, the Perry Mason stuff on television, and um, in my experience with uh, cross, I, I've made too many CLE talks about cross-examination. I think it needs to be short. I think it needs to get the point and get out. I think it needs to be rhythmic. Um, I think it needs to have uh, repetition so that the jury, rhythm and repetition go together so that the jury remembers what you've asked and then sit down. I don't think screaming and yelling uh, is very effective and I don't think the jury does either. Uh, so, you know, it depends on your case and whether you've got a decent, sometimes the best cross-examination is to look very confidently at the witness and say, I don't have any questions. Um, that may be better than anything else. <laughs> now, when you um, are trying a case or you're preparing a witness for a deposition, what do you think are the most important things that you do to try to help maybe a difficult witness get ready for deposition or trial? Well, um, obviously I tell them to tell the truth. Obviously I tell them to be on a deposition as brief as possible, commensurate with being accurate. I, I tell them, obviously, these are all things that all good trial lawyers uh, tell, their, tell their witnesses or their clients. Um, to listen carefully to the question, answer that question, and wait for the next question. Be polite, don't be rude, don't be sarcastic, it doesn't go over. And then I, I, uh, I usually, uh, depending on how good I think the witness is going to be, have at least one run through and maybe, maybe several run through to get that witness used to the idea of answering questions. and. Um, Sometimes even with a videotape, although I don't particularly like that, sometimes witnesses think that's helpful. Have you been involved in ever doing any mock trials or run-throughs of trials before you had a jury trial to kind of see how your uh, witnesses were going to do and how your theory was going to play with a jury? I, I've, I've been involved with mock trials. Um, I've been involved with um, moot court type uh, preliminary cases where we had, where we tried matters before a set of several groups of jurors. Um, yes, I've done a lot of that. And what did you think about whether or not that was an effective use of your time? You know, <laughs> sometimes I think it's effective and sometimes I think it's a waste of the client's money. Um, it's very difficult very difficult to duplicate the intensity and the focus of a real trial. Um, you can sound some things out and I know that um, a lot of uh, attorneys think that these approaches are terrific. I think a lot, uh, a lot of clients insist on them. I think a lot of clients want jury consultants who are listening to the voir dire, uh, I, I, I go with my, with my instinct, frankly. I, I value that more highly than, with due respect, than <laughs> jury consultants. But uh, we don't always agree, and that's okay. And maybe that's, I'm just old fashioned in that, and well could be. But it's very difficult to, um, duplicate that. And I certainly don't like the concept of a shadow jury where you're trying the lawsuit and you've got 12 people seated behind you who are telling you how you messed up during the afternoon. <laughs> That's, I don't want any of that. <laughs> if, I, if I mess up, I can usually tell it without somebody reminding me of it. But um, I, uh, I, I think it, it, it can be effective in getting some sense of the way a jury might think, but it's awfully hard to duplicate that. And just like it's hard to evaluate a jury, uh, you, you can psychoanalyze all 12 jurors and, and get a pretty good idea of what that person's propensities are. But when you put all 12 of them together, as you well know, uh, then you have a group psychology, which is in, could be very well entirely different from individual 
psychology. And so, gosh, it's, it's I think it's um, of limited value. So how do you think that uh, mediation and ADR have changed the law practice? I think it's terrific. Um, I think a, a good mediator can bring people together very effectively. I, I'm really, uh, I'm really uh, high on the idea. Um, obviously, they're especially in this day and time with the expense involved. Uh, I, I, I'm not so happy with arbitration as I am with uh, mediation. But I think mediation can be very helpful, at least in focusing. Um, parties on the weaknesses of their case. Every party thinks that his or her case, usually, unless they're very sophisticated, um, is a winner. And it's awfully help helpful if you have a good mediator who can say to your client, you, you know, you've got a loser and um, you need to uh, accept what they are offering or you need to put money, more money on the table, whatever. I think it's, it's been a remarkable change. What is it that you don't like as much about arbitration? Um, because I think there's a tendency to be Solomonic, to split the baby. And um, from my point of view, uh, primarily as a defense lawyer, um, I, I don't find that an effective approach for my clients. Um, on top of which, frankly, uh, my experience with arbitration, I know this is heresy, uh, has been that it's very expensive. I mean, we don't, we don't have to pay trial judges to try the cases other than their salary. But if you've got an arbitrator, you're paying that person, and maybe you have three arbitrators, and you're paying three people uh, who could be very expensive to, um, to make a decision. There are also certain limits on arbitration that I don't like. Um, some arbitrating, arbitration rules preclude extensive de deposition work. I understand the reason for that. It's to hold the cost down. On the other hand, if you have a major trial with a lot of money riding on it on either side, it's a tremendous risk to do that without a full um, feeling for what the case is all about, full knowledge of the case. So I, I'm, not, I'm not as big on arbitration. I've done it. I've arbitrated a case uh, as, as the arbitrator, but I, uh, I think mediation is much more effective. Leo, how has technology changed the practice of law, and do you use technology at all? Well, I, as you know, I'm not a I'm not a big uh, I'm I'm not a big technology expert. That's putting it very very mildly. I do have a cell phone. That's as far as I've gotten. Uh, but obviously, technology has uh, the computer process um, is essential if you've got a major trial. Um, in the water case, we had 100,000 documents on computer ready to use and ready to print out. There was just no way we could have handled that uh, effectively without a computer. And so it obviously has changed things. On the other hand, if you think in terms of uh, e-discovery, frightening. That is frightening. <laughs> it is. It's frightening and it's enormously expensive. Um, do you have a computer in your office? No, I so do not. how do you get your emails? Uh, my secretary prints them all out for me. You're now revealing my deepest, darkest secrets <laughs> that you, of course, already know about. Um, I don't like a having, having a machine beeping at me all day, and so I... Uh, and I leave that to my grandchildren and my children and, when and you, my secretary. And when you were, are in trial and computers are being used, then your other partners and associates and other people are yeah, the absolutely. ones using I mean, computers. I'm not foolish enough to say that they're useless. Of course, they're, 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 they've become essential in a complex trial. And um, <coughs> it's amazing to me, excuse me, 
that we, we could be in, uh, I can think of one patent case that we were trying, right in the middle of it, and um, one of the lawyers on my side could uh, text message back to um, the uh, people in my law firm who were checking out a particular case or checking out a particular issue right there while we were still in the courtroom. It's remarkable, and, and, and it's, it's fine. I'm, I'm not adept at it, that's all, but I've at least got enough sense to surround myself with people that are. So now when you get an email, do you, how do you respond to the email? I dictate the answer and, and my secretary types it up and there it goes. Uh, although the truth is, the truth is that I usually pick up the phone because I don't like to get emails from people in my office who are 20 feet away from me. <laughs> and so I either pick up the phone and talk with them or I walk down the hall and say, this is what I think. But uh, that's a sort of a flip answer. That if I get an email from otherwise, I dictate the answer and my secretary sends it out. Um, now, Leo, earlier we talked about your love of literature, and I know through the years you have uh, taught literature classes and taught specifically about the law in literature. Uh, tell us about that course that you've taught and why you think it's important. Well, I. I it really is a course. I, I do teach a literature course at Temple Israel um, for those who want to attend, but I have over the years given a talk at the bench and bar and a few other places whenever they've asked me. Um, I've collected some pieces of literature about law uh, because my argument is, and I'm deadly serious about this, um, we are, as lawyers, communicators. That's what we do. Now, we may communicate with a jury or a judge. We may communicate by writing a contract. We may communicate by um, creating a corporation. Whatever it is, we're communicators. So why not learn how the best communicators who ever lived did it? And my judgment is that the best way to do that is to read great literature. And so, that's my premise, and, and in making that little presentation, I uh, have six or seven or eight excerpts from uh, literature about the law, um, and read it, and, they, and people seem to like it, and nobody's booed me yet, and so uh, <laughs> hopefully maybe I'll do it again sometime. Are there some specific books uh, that have a legal theme that you really think that everyone ought to read? Sure. And what are uh, those? Merchant of Venice, uh, Shakespeare, Bleak House, Dickens, um, Crime and Punishment, um, um, Faulkner's, it's escaping me right now, um, the Devil and Daniel Webster, a short story by uh, Stephen Vincent Benet, is terrific. Uh, is terrific. Um, any um, any work by John Mortimer, uh, Rumpole of the Bailey. Um, there was a series of short stories that came out in the twenties. This is before my time, please. <laughs> um, written by uh, an assistant district attorney in New York City called Arthur Train. And he wrote stories about a ramshackled uh, Lincoln-esque type lawyer named uh, Ephraim Tut. And Mr. Tut um, always was on the right side of the issue. And he always won cases, um, either criminal or civil, by some esoteric, unknown facet of the law. It's fun to read. And, and um, Judge Greenfield Polk, uh, put me onto that years ago and gave me a volume of Arthur Train's work and they're, they're all out of print. But I've, uh, I've uh, collected all the books, all the short stories now and um, they're wonderful to read and that's good stuff. Um, that's good stuff. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, terrific 
uh, short stories that are available. Um, Scott Turow writes very good stuff, uh, legal stuff. Um, at Leo, several times you've mentioned various judges that you practiced in front of. What do you think of um, the relationship between the bench and the bar? Has it changed over the years? I don't think it's changed that much. I, I think maybe the bench and bar are a lot closer, at least in Shelby County, than perhaps they used to be. And probably the, the uh, bench bar conference has a lot to do with that. Um, probably, um, well, m maybe even the age of the judges being younger than perhaps they were when I started uh, has something to do with that. I'm not sure, but I think the relationship is pretty good. I really do. At least in Shelby County, I can't speak for <laughs> anybody else. Leo, you've had at least two major honors by your peers. Um, first, being one of the first recipients of the Lawyer's Lawyer Award by the Memphis Bar Association and being named Litigator of the Year by the Tennessee Bar Association. Um, how did those uh, awards make you feel? Real good, of course. <laughs> Real good. I, I'm, I'm flattered. I'm appreciative. Um, I, I appreciate the recognition, um, and um, it, uh, it's incentive to um, strive to do better, frankly. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what, was, what is the Lawyer's Lawyer Award, and as you've seen the recipients through the years, what do you think is important about being known sort of as the Lawyer's Lawyer? You know, I, I, I don't know what criterion or criteria were used to select me. I, I, I hope it has something to do with professionalism. I hope it has something to do with, um, with um, skill. Um, I hope it has something to do with courtesy and camaraderie uh, among uh, lawyers and with members of, of the bench. Um, That's what I hope it is. Um. Now, Leo, you've also, I know, been involved in the greater community, not just the legal community, for years. Uh, why were you involved in the community, and what kinds of ac community activities were you involved in? Well, the truthful answer is that my parents uh, showed me that example. Um, my father was very active in the community. My mother was very active in the community. And um, they didn't say go out and be active in the community. They um, set the example and uh, let me make that decision for myself. But I think it's important. I think it's important for lawyers to do that. We are uniquely trained to be effective leaders in the community. We are uniquely trained to do that. We we are supposedly uh, rational thinkers. We are supposedly articulate and we are supposedly well organized. <laughs> Hopefully that all that's true. And so uh, I think it's part of our obligation to go out in the community and do that. And I always have felt it important and so I've done it. What kind of uh, community activities were you involved in through the years? Well, I've been president of uh, my synagogue. I've been, uh, I've been president of the um, Memphis uh, Symphony. Um, I've been on the board of MIFA um, in Shelby County for several years. Uh, what does MIFA stand for? MIFA is Memphis Interfaith Association that is designed to uh, um, help the uh, disadvantaged people in Shelby County either with homes or with food um, or with uh, advice on uh, getting jobs. It's a remarkable institution and it's, it's uh, non-sectarian and um, very active and very effective. Uh, and I've been, I've been on the board of other organizations uh, from time to time and I think it's important to do. Have you also done any pro bono work? Yeah, I do a lot of pro bono work, some of which uh, I didn't intend 
that it be pro bono when I started, <laughs> but it ended up being that way. But yes, I have done a lot of that, and I think uh, that's obviously important. The Supreme Court obviously thinks it's important, and so I have done a lot of that. And uh, I've gotten some of my most uh, impressive fees from doing pro bono work, like a cherry pie and, um, and a birthday card. And um, I once uh, represented a lady who uh, my rabbi sent to me to uh, try to unravel some complicated real estate matter. And I spent hours and hours on it. And I finally got it worked out and had all the documents signed, and she came back in. And I noticed that she always come up town on the bus, and so I knew that while she didn't say anything, she couldn't possibly afford me. And so when she said, I appreciate all that you've done, she's very gracious, what do I owe you? And I said, well, look, I'm happy to do that, no fee. And she got very angry and said, you know, Mr. Behrman, I didn't come in here as a charity case. I want to go out and tell people that uh, you're my lawyer. And I didn't ask you to do this for nothing. And I, I'm, I, I learned something from that. I learned something. So I said, and she said, I, I want to pay a fee. You know, what do I owe you? And I said, well, let's see, uh, maybe 15 hours of work. I would say, um, Four dollars would be about right, <laughs> and so she very reluctantly. She thought that was a little high, <laughs> but um, she pulled four dollars out of this little snap purse and gave it to me, which I turned over to the popcorn fund. But I learned something from that. Um, people need to maintain their dignity, and um, she insisted on that. And, you know, there are obviously people that can't afford the $4, and I'm happy to do that work and have over the years. My father taught me to do that, and uh, it's an obligation now is, for all the lawyers to do. Is there anything else you can think of that your father taught you about the practice of law or life in general that maybe we haven't talked about yet today? My father taught me a lot about the practice of law and a lot about life in general that we don't have the time or or the uh, amount of videotape left to <laughs> talk about. But I can tell you a couple of things he told me. Number one, uh, be nice to the clerks. They can save your life. Uh, number two, when the judge gets ready to rule, sit down and be quiet. Never interrupt. Um, and number three, um, no matter how badly you're getting beaten up in the courtroom, you've got to look totally confident and totally at ease. I used to come home at night, uh, my legs were killing me. They were really sore, they were really hurt. And I couldn't figure out why I'd been sitting in the courtroom all day. I hadn't been running or anything. And I realized that I was trying to do exactly what Daddy told me. I was trying to look very calm above the council table, but I was tensing my <laughs> legs underneath the council table. So I tried to get out of that habit. But he taught me a lot about how to handle clients, how to approach lawsuits. Uh, I was very lucky to have him for the, my mentor, very lucky. Now, Leo, you are very soft-spoken. Do you ever get mad or yell or anything in terms of uh, what's going on at work? You talking about on the golf course? I'm <laughs> absolutely on the golf course. Um, I, Occasionally in the courtroom, but you've got to have a controlled, you've got to have a controlled outrage. If you lose your temper in a trial, you're going to lose the trial. You can't, can't lose your cool, lose your temper. You can indicate indignation, and you can indicate outrage, and you can do that effectively so that it's properly conveyed to the judge or to the jury without raising your voice to do it. In fact, I think it's much more effective if you don't. But you can, you can um, handle matters or questions uh, in an intense kind of way that can be very effective. It depends on, 
look, as trial lawyers, we're all under the microscope. The jury is looking at us every second. The jury tries the lawyers. Anybody that doesn't believe that hasn't tried a lot of cases. Um, I always tell my associates to be sure that the heels on your shoes aren't run down because the jury will notice that. I think the jury notices how you dress. The jury notices how you act. Uh, they really try us in the courtroom and so we've got to keep that in mind. It's, it's a microscope and um, we have to keep, keep that in front of us all the time. Now Leo as a mentor to partners like me and associates in our firm and, and lawyers throughout the community. Are there any other messages that you would give us about uh, our future law practice and our profession? <laughs> I, that's too broad and I, I can't imagine you know any messages that I could pontificate that would be of, of great merit except um, be professional. Be professional. That means be skillful. That means be courteous. That means um, be respectful of the courts, respectful of the fellow lawyers, and respectful of the law. I think, you know, we're, we're under fire. The, the law, the, the practice of law is under fire. Um, the average person in the community still doesn't like attorneys. They like their own attorney, perhaps, <laughs> but, but they don't like lawyers generally. And you can see that in the jokes people tell. I don't let people tell lawyer jokes around me. And, and my friends won't do that anymore because they know it. I, I see no reason to denigrate my own profession. Uh, we are under fire. And uh, if we don't do something about it, nobody else is going to. So I tell my students at the end of the year in my product liability class that it's up to them to do what they can to, to advance the professionalism idea and not to detract from it. It's easy to detract from it. It's very difficult to get it back. Leo, is there anything else that you wish I'd asked you about today and that you'd like to tell us? No, I just made that speech. <laughs> I just made that speech. I, I enjoy doing this. I, I'm not sure how uh, important or effective it is, but um, it made me think. And um, it made, I'll tell you one thing it did. It, it made me remember you didn't ask me about my, my junior high. You um, I skipped straight asked to me high about school. high school. <laughs> I went to a grade school called Pentecost Garrison School for Boys. Um, it was grades kindergarten through nine. And uh, it was very small and all the football teams from Snowden and Bellevue beat up on us pretty badly. Uh, but Miss Pentecost, uh, and her cousin, Miss Garrison, ran the school. It's, it's still out there on Union Extended where the, it's the school where the Board of Education is right now. So the building's there, but the school doesn't That's right, exist. the building is there. That was her building. Miss Pentecost taught me the most valuable thing as far as um, discipline is concerned, mental discipline, and that is that she, she made us sit down and do the work uh, until it was perfect. Uh, it wasn't enough that you knew it well. It wasn't enough that you knew it really well. She insisted on perfection. Now, you know, that has some drawbacks, but um, she taught her students that mental discipline was crucial, and I've, I've been in her debt ever since because of that. My final question, Leo, how would you like to be remembered as a lawyer? Hmm. I hope um, as a lawyer. As a lawyer. I hope as. And a person. <laughs> well, as a person, I hope as a, as a, as a 
person who uh, loved his family, but as a lawyer, uh, as someone who's professional in the way I've described it. That's, that's what I work at. And uh, if, if I'm remembered that way, then um, I'd be well satisfied, well satisfied. Thank you very much. Thank you.